Good morning. Uh, this morning we are going to be reading Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And as you turn there, I know that we are, uh, you are here to hear about God and His Word, but I know that as a guest preacher, you know, sometimes it's nice to get to know the person who's actually talking at you. So one of the things I wanted to start by saying is just thank you for having me. Um, when I was in seminary, I was in St. Louis, and I went to a small church. It was about 60 people, and it was one of the uh, most life-giving, grace-filled, loving environments that I've ever been a part of, and um, I kind of feel that way this morning. You guys actually brought me back to that environment. Um, uh, the smaller band and, and just the way that people were greeting and the way that you guys uh, introduced yourselves, uh, it brought me back to there. So thank you for that because that was just a, a really special time in my life that I miss. Um, uh, so um, my name is Michael Yurk. I'm one of the pastors at Faith Presbyterian Church. We're right before the PA border over in Wilmington. Uh, I have my wife, Catherine, and we have two daughters. Uh, one name is Claire. She is four. And the other one is Desiree, and she is two, and we just adopted her from foster care uh, back in June. So she was, we, we've been a part of her life since she was three months old, but we were able to, we were foster parents to her, and we just ended up adopting her in June. So we got to celebrate um, our first official Thanksgiving as a family together, and, and my wife was explaining that to my older daughter. She's like, hey, you know, this was the first year that we got to celebrate um, uh, Thanksgiving with Desiree as officially a part of our family, and, and my daughter, being wiser than us, was like, she's always been a part of our family. So um, that was a special moment for us. But um, as you're turning to Haggai, um, to give you a little background about Haggai, he is ministering to the Jewish people as they are returning from exile. So the Jews have been in exile for about 70 years under the reign of the Babylonians, and now a uh, Persian ruler named Cyrus has overtaken the Babylonians, and what he has decided to do is return the exiles back to their land. Um, so the Jews are allowed to return back to Judea, and not only that, but he has allowed them to rebuild the cities that they are part of. So one of the things that they're rebuilding is the Temple of God, and it's this glorious occasion where they get to come back and rebuild the Temple of God, and yet the problem is, is that the work has stalled, and the people are seeking things other than God. And the question for us in this passage this morning is, what do we seek other than God? So let us consider our ways as we read from Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheol, governor of Judea, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while, your ho while this house lies in ruin? Now therefore consider, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does, not, does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the, thus says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came too little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, will each of you bruises himself with his own house, busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withhold the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beasts and all their labors. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage that it is a reminder to consider our ways, to look at the ways in which we looked at fulfillment in things of this world instead of in you. We pray that this challenges us, that this disrupts our thinking and our actions and our patterns and allows us to respond in such a way 
that we love you and care for you and remind ourselves that you are the most important thing in our lives. In your name, amen. So I heard a prediction right when the coronavirus started, and it said this. A lot of people are about to learn that if they just had more free time, they would not, in fact, write a novel, learn a language, or get in shape. I would say that's true of me as well. When, when the coronavirus first started, I thought it was a two-week vacation that I was going to relax. And as it progressed, I started making a list of goals to accomplish. And one of the goals was actually, uh, when we first moved into our home about a year and a half before the coronavirus started, uh, one of the closets didn't have doorknobs on it. So I put on my list to put doorknobs on this closet. They're still not on the closet, all right? Um, I know I didn't accomplish the goals that I had set out for, even though we're returning sort of back to normal. And, and the people in this passage, they had one goal, and they didn't accomplish it either. It was to rebuild the temple of God. And they actually had so much time in this passage that this passage is actually taking place 18 years after they've returned to, from exile. The issue is not about time. It's about heart and about motivation. And aren't we like the people in this passage? Because if, if someone was to give you a question, like give careful thought to your ways. Are you seeking money? Are you seeking food? Are you seeking status? What are the things in this world that you're seeking that is not fulfilling you? How would you respond? Or if, if God was to come to you and say, give careful thought to your ways, have you been busy with your own life, fulfilling, putting things back into your life that, that just take time away from me and my purpose for you? How would you respond? You see, we, like the people in this passage, usually tend to focus on things that won't actually bring us fulfillment and leave us actually dissatisfied and wanting more. And this morning, we're going to actually have to challenge ourselves and walk through sort of a difficult truth that at times, we try to fulfill our lives with things where we get busy and we try to uh, look for the things of this world to make us happy and bring us joy, and yet they don't, and instead, we need to actually be focusing on God. So we're going to give careful thought to our ways and be challenged. But if we challenge ourselves, if we recognize what God is drawing us to in this passage, that we are to look to him alone, then what's going to happen is our lives are going to be radically disrupted in a good way. And not only that, but we're going to learn how we are to respond and to love others better. This passage is supposed to shape us. God is supposed to shape us. So let us have that happen this morning and give careful thought to our ways. So first, what do we seek instead of God? Go back to the passage, uh, verses 5 and 6. And this is what it says. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Did I just read about common American life? Because that's how I feel. Because what's happening in this passage, it's not actual literal holes. It's not that people are getting money and putting it in a purse and everyone in the town has a hole in it. It's not that, that people are trying to find water and they can't find it. But what is it? It's actually the complete opposite. There's such abundance in their life. They have so much that they are just seeking more of it. They have so much that they're seeking the next thing that will satisfy them. And, and what it is, is it's, again, it's, it's our culture as well, where it's, it's this idea of, all right, if I just get to $10,000, then I'll be happy, and I'll, I'll be secure. And then you get to that point, and it's like, oh, that's, that's not enough. Now if I just get to $20,000, and if I get to $50,000, and if I, just make more, if I just make a little bit more money, I'll be happy. But it feels like our bank accounts have holes in them, and that we're just putting more and more money into it. And what the people in this passage are thinking is, that if I just have a little bit more money, if I have just a little bit more food, if the harvest is just a little bit better, then I'll feel secure. I'll feel happy. I'll feel content. But what happens when you get that more money? 
that bigger harvest. It feels like it's not enough. And why is this so bad for the people in this passage? Because 18 years earlier, they were living in exile. They had nothing. They were slaves to an op... They, they weren't even home. They were slaves and servants to rulers. They had no wealth to their name. And yet, what does God do? God brings so many blessings to these first returnees. He brings them to a place of abundance. And, and as it says in the book of Ezra, it says that God had rescued them, that God had provided for them, that God actually allowed them to go back to their homes and rebuild the city, that he provided a ruler who said, you can go back to the way that it once was in which you build the temple of God. And yet, what has happened 18 years later? They forgot the one who rescued. They forgot the one who has given them an identity the one who would actually fulfill and secure them, the one who was going to give them hope. And they replaced it with a lie. They replaced it with, if I get this thing, if I get more money, if I get more food, if I get a bit better house, then I'll finally find what I've been looking for. And this is the classic consumeristic mentality that we all have. Uh, recently on Twitter, um, I, I saw one of the trending topics was, uh, you stole my home. And I thought that was kind of interesting. It was like, how do you steal someone's home and why is everybody talking about it? Um, so I clicked it and come to find out that millions of Americans spend their days looking at homes on Zillow that they can't afford. Um, and, and they scroll through and they look at these homes and they go, oh, if only I could live on the, in this home or, or this is my dream house. And, and Zillow, being the good realtor app that it is, allows you to favorite or like or, or save a home. So what ends up happening is people favorite their favorite home and, and their dream home, and uh, eventually it ends up getting sold, and Zillow sends them a notification, your dream home has been sold. Uh, so, so basically everyone was talking about how all these people had stolen their dream home for them. And, and I know it's silly, it's a silly illustration, um, and, and we even do this in church. I mean, when we get together in small groups or stuff, we try to have fun where we go, hey, if you could go anywhere on vacation, where would you go? Or if you had a million dollars, what would be the first thing you spend it on? And, and what's wrong with that? Well, what is this passage warning us about? It's actually saying that what we focus on is the thing that we love the most. And for the people in this passage, it was their work, it was their homes, it was their money, it was themselves. And it was not God who would actually fulfill them. And you see, the people in this passage, even though they were focused on other things, would have claimed to love God. They're the people of God. They're the people who love God. They're, they're God's chosen people. And if you, if you went to one of them, you would say, do you love God? They'd say, oh yeah, I love, I love God. And they probably didn't think they were lying. But in the moment that they chose to build their home before they build the temple, they loved those things more than they loved God. And we do the same thing. There's a lot of time, we as, a, as a believers, we say we love God. I love God. But when I focus on other things in my life, when I focus on my wealth, when I focus on me time, when I focus on the things of this world saying, if only I get this thing, I'll be satisfied. What am I actually loving? I love that thing more than I love God. I love my home more than God. I love Amazon more than God. I love Netflix more than God. I love my time more than God. I love my money more than God. So let's give careful thought to our ways. What is it that you're seeking in your life that you think will fulfill you? What is it that you're seeking to fulfill you that never will? And just consider this, I mean, it's Christmas time, and, and you know, during Christmas time, we usually do shopping for other people's, but there's sometimes the tendency to shop for ourselves, right? We, you know, but just, 
just go back through your Amazon cart over this past year. What are some things that you, in the moment when you bought it, you thought, this is going to be something that's going to make me so happy, and maybe six months to a year later, it's just sitting there. So to give you an example, you know, there's, there's those pots and pans. You know, I, I need new pots and pans. I know, so that's one of the Christmas gifts for our, my families that we're going to, mostly for my wife. I can't cook. But um, I'm going to buy her pots and pans. And I'm excited for it, and I think she'll probably be excited for it. And what will happen is I'm going to go to Amazon. I'm going to click this new shiny pots and pans, get, see all the reviews of how great they are. And I'm going to think, this is going to make me and my wife so happy. And I'm going to put it in my cart. And two days later, it's going to be arrive, and I'm going to get so excited to see it on my doorstep. And then on Christmas Day, me and my wife are going to be so excited and so happy because we're going to unwrap it. And maybe the first meal that she cooks, it's going to be the best meal that we've ever had. And then six months later, when we pull them out of the drawers, what's going to happen? Oh, we have to cook dinner again. <laughs> The thing that we thought was going to bring us happiness and joy, maybe for a little bit does, but it's going to be fleeing. And maybe for you it's not shopping. Maybe for you it's not Amazon. Maybe for you it's you're a foodie. And you've gone and you've tried different restaurants, and you've gone and you've tried plenty of different meals, and you thought, oh, if, if, if we could just check out this next place, if I could just have a better meal, then I'll be happy, and yet you're always wanting the next thing. Or maybe for you, it's that traveling. You finally get to go traveling again, and you say, oh, if only we could go on vacation again. If only we could travel again. If only we could go to this part of the world, I'll be happy. But you still say, there's always more to be seen. Or maybe you've gotten the job, you've gotten the title, you've gotten the money that comes along with it, and yet you're still sitting there going, it's not enough. It's not enough recognition, it's not enough money, it's not enough control that it leaves you wanting more. And I recognize that, look, I don't want to hear this. It's a hard time. I don't want to believe it. I want to believe that I can both seek God and seek the things that would make me happy. But I know that's not possible. I can't serve two masters. I can't serve two gods. And it's either do I seek God or do I seek the things of this world and myself. What have we put before God in our lives? And again, this is the same with the people in this passage. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. They're building their home. Doesn't that sound reasonable? And yet God said, you put your home before me. So what does God do? How does God respond? He does what we need in our lives as well. And what he does is he radically disrupts their lives and ours. Because not only should we not find fulfillment in the things of this world, but God says, I'm actually going to take away the very things that you guys are looking for. Because look at verses 9 through 11. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, will each of you busy himself with his own home? Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the ground which brings forth, on man and beast and all their labors. God is clearly saying in this passage, I am the one who caused a drought. God is pointing the blame on himself. And that doesn't sit well for a lot of us, right? Because we're saying, wait a second, that... That seems weird, like a God who loves his people. Um, you're telling me this loving God, this God who is good, he's the one who is causing a drought? And the answer is yes. God is radically disrupting their lives so they'll stop seeking the things that actually are harming them and seek God instead. One of, one of the best ways to maybe see God's perspective in this situation is toddlers. And again, I, I, I told you I have two daughters. We went and visited some cousins for Thanksgiving. There was, there was about six of them under five years old, all right? So it was chaos. Um, but one of the toys that they got to play with is that classic hammer and sort of building block set, you know, where you take the hammer and you kind of hit the blocks in and, and you know, you get to flip it back around and they hit them again. And, and it's a lot of fun. 
Now, boys being boys, and, and I have two daughters, so I'm not around little boys too much, they like to use hammers in other ways. And, and one of the ways that one of the cousins used a hammer was to swing it and hit another cousin. Um, and he thought he was goofing around, he was having fun, and, and you know, we go, no, 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 don't do that. Like, just, you know, and we, we come over and we show the cousin, we say, look, you just, you hit the blocks, you know, you flip it over, you hit the blocks again, and you let them go back, and then what happens again? They take the hammer, and this time, they hit themselves in the head, you know, and they, they kind of look at you, and you look at them, and they kind of get teary, and you go, no, 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 don't do that. What ended up happening? We had to take the hammer away. The thing that was supposed to bring them joy, the thing that was supposed to have them be satisfied and content, the thing that was supposed to not bring them harm actually brought them harm. The thing that was intended for good was actually intent, used for, for bad. And for the people in this passage, it's the same thing. God is radically disrupting their lives so that they'll stop seeking themselves and instead seek him. And we are radically disrupting the lives of a toddler when we take away the toy because they look at you and they go, wait, this person who gave me this toy, who loved me, is now taking it away? That doesn't seem loving. But a toy hammer on its own is supposed to be for fun but can quickly turn to harm. On its own, a good harvest is supposed to bless the community and bless the people, and yet it can be turned to harm. I mean, we know that, this, even in this country we know that, that, that people have used their wealth and their power to actually oppress other people. That they've been blessed, that they've been given wealth and they've given provision, and yet they haven't used it to bless other people, instead they've used it to bless themselves and further themselves. And so what these people need and what we need as well is for God to come in and radically disrupt our lives because they would have never stopped. They would have taken another 18 years to rebuild the temple. They would have said, look at how much we've been given. Let's get more of it. And yet God has now taken it away and said, listen, you haven't been using it the way that it was intended. And what you need to do is search for something deeper than a better home or more wealth. Because think about this. Um, this was something also that happened uh, during the coronavirus. Think about this. When you go home, when you're having dinner with your family, do you usually ask the deeper questions of life? In ordinary life, do you usually take time to ask deeper questions? Do you sit down with your family at night and everything's fine, everything's going well, and you go, you know what, I think tonight's a good night to talk about death. You know, maybe tonight we should talk about eternity. Maybe tonight we should talk about suffering. No, most of the time we don't ask the deeper questions of life. We actually need something to disrupt our lives that causes us to ask those deeper questions. And here's the thing, before coronavirus, I don't think any of us ever asked the deeper question of, imagine if everything got closed down. Imagine if I had to cease contact with the ones that I love in person, what would I do? And yet God came in and radically disrupted our lives and made us think about the deeper questions. Because ordinary life, ordinary life doesn't cause, just makes us okay with everything. It doesn't cause us to ask deeper questions. There's no motivation to search for God when everything's going fine. And unless we see a disruption in our lives, unless we come to the point where we admit that there's a problem, that there's suffering, that something's going wrong, that something needs to change, then we will not search for God. We will just continue to do the things we've always done and seek the things that always bring us comfort and find that we're always longing for more. And I think this is a perfect passage for this time because there has been massive radical disruption in our lives. I know I'm still feeling the effects of COVID. I have no doubt that some of you still are. And what God is saying to us is, I'm the one who radically disrupted your life. Now, how do we respond to it? Are we going to ignore it? Are we just going to try to go back to everyday life, back to the way that it always was, to just, to just say, all right, that was a thing of the past, and let's just move forward. Let me, let me just go back to the things that brought me comfort. Or is it time to turn aside, to make room, and to seek God? Because we need God. We need God in our lives. We need God to come in and radically disrupt our lives. And the most radical thing that God has ever done in our lives is has given us the gospel. The most radical disruption and thought pattern that can be given to us. It's, 
It's the gospel in which God says, listen, there is God and there is us and there is separation between us because of sin. Because of sin, we cannot be in a perfect relationship with God. And yet a courtroom drama unfolds in which we are sentenced as guilty, in which the sentence, the penalty for sin is death. And yet as the judge is about to say the penalty for this person is death, then a man stands up in the courtroom, Jesus Christ, and says, I will take that punishment. I will take the punishment that this man deserves. I will be the one to die. And he'll say, you get to go free. And not only free right now, but free for the rest of your life. Any sin that you commit, anything wrong that happens that you do will be forgiven. And isn't that the most radical disruption of our lives? Because what does the rest of the world say? You need to perform. You need to succeed. You need to do well. I mean, even think about the recent cancellation culture. You do one thing wrong, you're canceled. And what does God say? I've seen everything you've done wrong, and you are loved. Is that not a radical disruption in the thinking and pattern of our lives? Is that we get to go forth from today and go, I am loved, not because of what I've done, but because what Christ has done. And I get to go forth knowing that I don't have to succeed, that I don't have to perform, but I get to know that I am a daughter and son of the King. So my life isn't about pursuing things. It isn't about performance. It's about following God. It's about looking to God and saying, my heart needs to be set on the one who set me free more than anything else. And how can we find the things in God that we've been seeking in this world? Because God has disrupted our lives. He's given us the gospel. And the point that he's about to make is to say, make room for me and seek me alone. And let me just encourage you, uh, one of the ways to apply this through your life is, is if, if once a day you take just five minutes out of your day to think through why you do certain things, to actually take five minutes and say, why am I doing this? So for example, um, you know, a lot of us like to doom scroll, right? We like to go through Facebook and Twitter or Instagram, whatever it may be, and start scrolling. What if you just took five minutes out of your day to go, why am I doing this? What am I hoping to find? How am I hoping that this will make me happy or fulfill me in this moment? And maybe for you it's not Facebook, maybe for you it's, it's cleaning up your home or, or making sure everything's perfect and tidy. Why do I always need my home to be like this? Or maybe for you it's Netflix, it's just that, you know, let's, let's just watch a few hours of TV and say to yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I seeking this thing? And take that time to let God use that moment to disrupt your life, to change your heart, to change your thinking, to change your life. Because we are so tempted to seek things other than God. But we need God to come and radically disrupt our life. So when that happens, how do we respond? Well, what does God call the people to do? Look at verse 8. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. He actually calls them to just simply do the very thing that he commanded them to do 18 years ago. Build my temple. And why is that so important? It's because it's not simply a building, right? The temple, it wasn't just about the structure of the temple, it's the restoration of the focus of the people being on God, of being in a relationship with God, of the temple being a place where the the people of God gather together to be with God, to repent of their sins, to hear about the promises of God, to hear about the love of God, to be the light of the world. And they were to do it together. They were to do it together as a body of believers, not to just do it in their individual homes, but to come together like we're doing this morning. And while for us, there's no longer the visible symbol of the temple where, you know, all the Christians gather together. We have churches together and we have the visible symbol of Christ sitting here today. You as a church are the visible symbol of Christ, of us pouring our lives, pouring our energy, pouring our time into pursuing his purposes for this world. 
to get up and to work on building the kingdom of God in this world so that we may honor and glorify him. As commentator James Boyce says in this passage, he says this, the word of God by Haggai comes to such people and to you if you are one. God says, what is the condition of my house? What is the condition of my work in your home, in your church, your neighborhood, your city, your land? He says, what are you doing to fulfill the purpose for which you have been set apart by Jesus Christ? So how are we to respond? The question for us this morning is, how are we fulfilling the purpose of God in our lives? And one challenge for us is what the passage calls us to. We build. We build each other up under the love of God. Because it's all too easy for my life to focus on myself, to say, here is my home, here is my family, here is my life, let me be self-sufficient. But there is a radical disruption taking place right now for these people and for us as we're hearing this passage that teaches us that we need God and we need to build each other up. We need to build up the kingdom of God. And what does Jesus say? Jesus actually says, they will know we are Christians by our love, right? That's what Jesus calls us to, is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love one another, people will know I have come. And so what are we called to do? We're called to humble ourselves and say, my life is not about me. That for me to be fully me is to not pursue myself or the things that I desire, but, but for actually me to pursue God's calling in my life and to love other people. That we need each other. And so let me challenge you. Let me challenge you that one of the ways to build up the kingdom of God is to build up each other. So let me encourage you to call or text someone today. Not this week, because I know if I say this week, we probably won't do it. Do it today, all right? This afternoon, call or text someone today and say, hey, I know I don't say it all the time, and there's a tendency maybe for me to focus on myself, but I'm really glad you're in my life. I'm really glad you're in my life. And if they know Jesus or if they don't know Jesus, just say, I am thankful that God brought us together because I love you, and I'm thankful for you being in my life. And if you need to, you can say, the pastor this morning told me that I have to do this. But just imagine how much more kingdom building and life giving that is than the things that we typically pursue in this world. I mean, match up, and again, I'm not saying that this is wrong to go on vacation, but match up going on vacation versus, t versus telling someone that they're loved. Which is more life-giving? Which is more following the purpose of God? You making your home and building more on your home and putting more money into your home? Or you saying, what is, how can this money be used to care for another person that was built in the image of God? Just challenge ourselves in this way. To say, what can I do to have a life-giving and life-building life that God has called me to. Now listen, I understand that this is a hard passage. It's a hard passage for me. As I was driving here this morning, I'm, you know, I'm running through the passage in my head and I go, I gotta change a lot of things. <laughs> it's hard. Change does not come easy. We have the tendency to focus on ourselves, but we need God. And we need a radical disruption in our lives. And that has come this morning through this passage. And thankfully, God provides one every single Sunday. That is my encouragement to you, is to come to church every Sunday, because guess what? It is a radical disruption in your life. I know that there is millions of Christians around the world that do this every Sunday, but listen, to someone who's not a believer, this would be a disruption in their life. Them having to get up on a Sunday morning would be a disruption. You are disrupting your life. You are allowing God to disrupt your life by coming here this morning, worshiping him, and hearing from his word. Do not cease to do that. And we need to build up his kingdom. We are not called to build up our own. But let's build up each other. Build up the kingdom of God for his glory. God's kingdom and his people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that this passage is hard. 
that it is difficult because there's a lot of things in this world that is pleasing and satisfying to us, at least for a moment, whether it be wealth, whether it be our time, whether it be entertainment, whether it be vacations, whatever it may be, it is something where we typically seek things to satisfy us that never will. And instead, you have called us in this passage to seek you. So we pray that this is the radical disruption that we need, that it will disrupt our thinking, disrupt our patterns, disrupt our actions, so that we may pursue you. And as you called the people in this passage to do, let us build up your kingdom by building up one another. You have called us the kingdom of God. You have made us sons and daughters of you. And we pray that we work as a church to build up each other and build up those around us. In your name, amen. Christ, this blessing is for you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace.